is hypertrophy and one of the primary drivers of hypertrophy in the context of a accessory work program for CrossFit setting specifically. Okay. So what are the primary drivers of hypertrophy? Anyone know? So anyone know what hypertrophy means? Overload. No. Yeah, overload is, yeah. Uh, is hypertrophy is, is just a fancy term for muscle growth. Yeah, you're right? You're breaking so the muscle down. You bring the muscle down and it repairs and it gets bigger and stronger, and that way we can lift more weight. And the way that happens is through two pathways. One of them is maybe through mechanical tension, and the other is maybe through volume and load. Right? So what is mechanical tension? How so long in, how long so the muscle is under stress or yeah, so how, well, how much stress the muscle gets put under, right? So that, that is a low, there's a load aspect to that. So basically, if you are doing back squats at 100 pounds and you reach a point where you're almost at failure, right? So those last two, three reps where you're almost at failure, so say reps seven, eight, nine, or like three reps away from failure, two reps away from failure, one reps away from failure, and then the 10th rep is like I fail on that rep. Those last three reps are generally going to be your hypertrophy reps. Mm -hmm. The first couple reps, you're not putting your muscle through enough mechanical tension to cause or to stimulate growth, but those last three reps are going to be your working set. Okay, does that make sense? Yep. Mm -hmm. Cool. So now load and volume. So how much volume do we need? How much load do we need to build muscle? Anyone know? I guess it'd be like more than you can handle. <laughs> rest at the it has to keep getting. It has to keep going up. So yeah. if you do three to ten of a back squat of 100 pounds every single week for the rest of your life, are your legs going to get bigger? Yeah. The answer yeah. is no, right? Because you're not challenging that muscle. The first couple of weeks, maybe yes, and then after that, the, that's going to go down. Okay, that stimulus is not going to be there in order to make the muscle grow. So we have to keep progressively overloading the weight or the volume in order to continue to stimulate the muscle to, to, to continue to make it grow. Make sense? Mm -hmm. So. Now let's identify, how do we identify a lagging muscle group? Okay, so that's what we're really here to figure out, right? We all have weak spots. How many of you were to fail to squat out of bottom? Anybody? Most of you? Cool. Okay, so if you're failing to squat out of the bottom, what does that tell us about what muscle groups need to be brought up in order to continue to progress in the squat? The squat? Move glutes. Out of the bottom. So we want to, when we're thinking about lagging muscle groups, we want to think about what the function of the muscle that we're using is. What is the primary muscle we're trying to use in that movement pattern? So for instance, if we're talking about squat, what is the primary mover in a squat? Your legs, but what specific muscle in your leg? Your quad. And how do we lengthen the quad and then contract the quad? <laughs> so I wanted you guys to think about this in terms of your anatomy. So, we talked about it a little bit before when we were talking about the nurture position, mm -hmm. but what, what action lengthens the quad? What, what, joint, yeah, what joint action, I should say? The extension of the hip, right? Nope. They well, hold. sort of, because there is a muscle in your quad that connects your knee to your hip, but yeah. generally speaking, the quad is going to be lengthened through flexion of the knee. So, Not. the deeper your knee angle gets, the more your quad lengthens, right? And then as you stand up, your quad contracts. But if you have so much fat back there, it's not, it's not mad. Really? It's it's a, your, your muscle and your fat are in different, different places, right? Your, your fat's at the top of your muscle. It's not, that does not stop the muscle from functioning. It's just another aspect of why it's there. Okay? So as we're squatting down, our knees are coming forward. Our hips might be going back slightly, but our knees are primarily going forward, and our quad is lengthening. As we stand up, that quad is then contracting, and that will be what's primarily moving that quad muscle up. Lengthening and contraction of the quads was causing you to stand up and squat down. Okay? So if you're failing a squat out of the bottom, you're able to lengthen that quad, but you're not able to contract it hard enough to then stand up. Okay? The top of the lip, so if you're failing the top, that might not necessarily be a quad issue. That might be a hip or a glute issue, right? Because the top of the squat, you're standing up, you squeeze your butt, and you finish the movement. So where you fill a lift is going to tell us a lot about what is the lagging muscle group in that lift. So let's talk about another movement. What about bench press? How many of you guys have filled a bench press at the top? Mm -hmm. So like halfway up, you're like stuck. No, yeah. Okay, everybody? So what is the primary device that locks out your bench press at the top? Tricep. Sure. Your tricep, right? And your pecs working together. And most of your tricep, right? So if you're having problems at the bottom of your bench press, more than likely it's your pecs are not engaging maximally to help you get the bar high enough for your tricep to finish it. If you're having trouble, or if you're having not, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, if you're having, if you're, you have the ability to get it off your chest because you're here and you can't lock it out, 
more than likely your tricep is weak. Because what do your triceps do? Because think about you extend the elbow, right? And what do your biceps do? They flex the elbow. So you want to start thinking about these muscles as not just like what you feel them in, is what their actual primary function is. Right? So your tricep extends your elbow, your bicep flexes mm -hmm. your elbow, your quad extends your knee, your quad also can extend your hip a little bit at the top, your hamstring flexes your knee, so when you pull up like this, you're flexing that knee, that's a hamstring movement. When you're hinging through the hips, that's gonna be a hamstring movement as well. There's tons of different movement patterns these muscles are responsible for doing different things, right? So, what, what, what's the problem with failing a squat at the bottom every single time? You'll never so get better at the bottom position. You fail every time. Exactly, you'll never get better at that position, right? And we're always gonna have that compensatory pattern so what is a compensation pattern? And uh, might it occur if the muscle group is not targeted correctly, right? So if you're sitting back really far in a squat and you're still failing the bottom, that means you're not primarily engaging your quad enough on the way down. So your quad might be strong enough, but you're just moving incorrectly in order to engage that quad. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So you want to think about not just the muscle being used, but how are you trying to use it, right? So if I'm trying to target my triceps on something, I want to keep my elbows close to my body and I want to try to get as much flexion as elbow as possible. If I'm not doing that, I'm not targeting my tricep as efficiently as I could be, therefore I'm not stimulating the amount of growth I need to to improve that muscle group. Does that make sense? Who can give you some examples of, of where, how they fail lifts and what might be the cause of it? Yeah, my, 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 lift, my um, initials, uh, like getting it off the ground with a heavy okay. bag. So let's talk about the deadlift. So what is the primary mover on a deadlift? Hamstrings. Hmm? Hamstrings are definitely a primary mover. What else? Hamstrings, glutes. Uh, Hamstrings, lower glutes. back. Okay. Lower back's another part of it. Erectors. There's, there's a ton of movements. There's a ton of muscles involved in a deadlift, right? Mm -hmm. That's why it's such a hard movement is because there's so much muscle involved. And when we fail a deadlift off the floor, what's going to happen is actually our quads are what's going to drive that weight off the floor. Okay? We're going to lean back and we're going to use, we're gonna use uh, mechanical advantage against that bar as much as we can. But the, the primary pusher off the ground is going to be your quads, right? Because where your quads lift, extend your knee. Your hamstrings need to be loaded because you need to, be able to extend your hip to the top. But your quads are probably weak in that bottom position, and that's what's causing you not to be able to weight off the ground. So strengthening your quads automatically brings up your deadlift. So let me ask you one question: How come my squat, like even from the bottom position, my quads are like plenty strong? I'm glad you asked that question, Pete. <laughs> so we talked about compensatory patterns. So, when Pete squats, I wish I had a video of this to show you guys. What does he do first on that squat? Yeah, yeah. What, tell me, what do you do first on a squat? I unrack the bar. When do you start squatting down? Um, well, I mean, I, I try to get everything as tensioned as possible in my lats, my upper back. Yeah, totally. I breathe, awesome. I brace, and then I, I uh, what do I start? Yeah, I, start sitting, I start sitting down. Your butt and hands are up. Yeah, so he starts sitting down. See what you said there? So he initiates his squat by sitting back into his hips and then allowing his knees to come forward as he needs to. But if you ever watch Pete from the side, his knees are not traveling super far forward over his toes, right? So he's not getting maximal quad engagement out of his squat. What he's doing is loading more of his hips, which are a stronger muscle group, which is why if he can get the off the ground, he can generally finish it. Getting it off the ground is the hard part because his squat is not a quad dominant squat. So how would Pete improve his squat and his deadlift Focusing more on quad dominance in the squat. So focusing more on fixing his compensatory pattern of sitting back first and then letting his knees drift forward slightly on the way down. Does that make sense? Are you so so I, need, how do I need to, that would be what I would want to isolate my quad. You wouldn't want to isolate my quads are fine. Yeah, no, no. You're, you're good. Your quads might be strong in the position you put them in, but that doesn't mean that they're strong in every position. Okay. okay? So developing his quads more will, and, and then squatting deeper and getting more flexion. So Pete is also not known to squat the deepest. He'll hit parallel, but that's about it. So squatting deeper means more flexion in the knee, which means more quad activation, which means more parts of that quad are gonna get stronger. So the quad is made up of four muscles, right? The vastus medialis, the vastus lateralis, the vastus intermedius, and then the rectus femoris, okay? If all four of those muscles aren't strong in unison, then you're not gonna have a strong quad in general, and therefore you might have a strong VMO or a strong lateralis, but that's not gonna make the whole quad engage as hard as it could if everything was balanced. So would his knees need to track further forward? Yes, exactly. He would need to practice squatting deeper with a more flexed knee angle. That can mean elevating his heel, staying on the, the wedge that we have 
over here, something like that, that will cause him to engage his quad more. Or use a machine, because we're going to talk about machines later, like we have here with tons of them, like the belt squat. The belt squat takes away all the load off your back and forces you to just use your legs in a squat. Like so the weight's pulled around your waist, not on your spine. So squatting could be limited by how strong is my back. That does not limit your, that back position does not get limited on that belt squat. Okay, because it's only about how strong your legs are, because there's no weight on your back, it's around your hips. Make sense? Any questions about that stuff? Who else gives an example of a movie they're not so good at? I think Demon You're gonna have to be more specific. It's so hard, so Snatch. Snatch yeah, 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 it's, it's happening. Snatch. Okay, so Snatch, what, is, what do you feel is the thing holding you back on your Snatch? The weight. <laughs> Okay, so your weight, you're overhead position, right? Yeah. So, if she's having trouble holding weight over her head, what does that tell us about what muscle group needs to be strong? Shoulders, probably. Shoulders, like, definitely. Yeah, I was gonna say like a whole, like, scapular region has to work. That, that's probably more accurate, right? So, shoulders are very rarely a muscle that's underutilized, especially in a CrossFit setting, because we use them so goddamn much. Um, but what is my part, what might be underutilized is that upper back scapular region, right? So, when we're talking about the scap, we have multiple different functions in the scapula. It can retract, it can elevate, it can depress, it can protract. And she's probably having trouble stabilizing that bar because her shoulder blades aren't strong in this overhead position holding retraction. So as she's going down, things start to come forward, and then the bar drops in front of her. So how might she address that issue? Uh, building up strength there. So she's trying to get her back. Really she can stack really easy. Yeah, stacking is not her problem. Yeah. The strength in that position yeah. is her problem. Yeah. So yeah. developing a strong, thick upper back will allow her to support more weight over her head, right? And that could be from pressing behind the neck or something like that, or some form of lateral raise for the shoulders. And then when we start hitting the upper back, it's gonna be more of an upper back focused row. Mm -hmm. So focusing on squeezing the shoulder blades together and getting all that meat of the upper back locked in, as long as some rear delt work or stuff like that. Okay, those are ways that she can improve her position overhead, strengthen those muscles, and then get more stability through that strength. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or any other examples we can give for someone failing a lift or oh bottom of the bottom of the deadlift too. Like uh, that's usually mine when I perform my hip work. I would be able to get to the mid quick the mid calf and that's it. So I'd be done there. Let's talk about Boz's deadlift. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. So I have, the, I have the advantage of having seen most of you guys do these lifts, so yeah. I, I have a little yeah. more insight. So when Boss sets up for a deadlift, he does several things, not perfect lifts, let's leave it at that. <laughs> so when Boss sets up for a deadlift, when, when, when you set up for a deadlift in general, where, where do you want to be pretty much hit to shoulder ratio, like over the bar? Anyone know? Straight up or down, or the, oh, hip to shoulder. Yeah, to shoulder ratio. Do you want to be like this? Like, like no. hip to shoulder? Like, no. You want to be like... You want to be we're slightly elevated, but our shoulders will always be slightly above our hips, right? What happens if we do like a stiff leg or like this? What's getting loaded more predominantly? Sure. Hamstrings and back. Hamstrings and back are getting loaded a lot more predominantly. And you're missing that initial quad push off the ground. So when Boz is built like a giant crane, okay? Just like me. So he's got long legs, long arms, and short torso. Just like I have. Okay. Taller than me, but generally speaking, we have the same body kind of shape and proportion. Mm -hmm. So he's really good at doing this stiff leg position because his arms are really long, so he can grab the bar with a nice flat back in here. But he never really sits back into those quads and hips and will allow him to get the bar off the ground. So again, strengthening the quads to get more comfortable in that bottom position really help Boz's deadlift out. Okay, questions about that? Same as Pete. Is it pretty much the same issue? Yours is just slightly different because your position is off. His position is not off. His quads are just relatively weak compared to the rest of his posterior chain. Will it be the same thing when you do the backstroke? It has to do with the with the quads. You have to work. Like well, yeah. Think, well, think about again. Think about the muscle being used in the function of the muscle. So when you're doing a box jump. What's the primary mover in your box jump? Is it the quad? It's not, right? What is it? Not quite. Hamstring? It's glute, hips, and hamstrings, right? Yeah. So but when you land, right? Yeah, when you land, you're landing in the squat. But that's not that's not the, the part you're having trouble with, right? It's the takeoff. Because if you can't take off high enough, you can't. No, I have trouble with the landing. So what's what type of issue with landing? I I see people going like that and if well, I jump and I go like that, I feel like I'm falling. Well, how, so how like, deep you get on a box jump is really dependent on the height, right? Uh, so if, if as the box gets higher, you're going to you're gonna by necessity need to get lower in that squat in order to land on the box, right? Because I can only bring my knees up so high. 
right? So like when I, if I jump on a 40 inch box, I might be catching the bottom of a squat. If I jump on a 24 inch box, I might be catching like stand up like this. Because this is not that high where I need to facilitate squatting down that deep. Mm -hmm. But if I'm jumping really high, my knees are like getting to here where I'm jumping so that I have to land in that very similar position. So that might not necessarily be a lagging muscle group issue, it might be more of a technique issue. Oh, okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. All right, so how do we bring up these lagging muscle groups now? First thing we're gonna talk about is how to establish MEV. Anyone know what MEV stands for? I wrote it in the email. You guys were here? You guys read it? Max. I read it. Max <laughs> muscle. Nope. Motion. Nope, it's a minimum, Momentum. minimum effective volume, right? Mm. So we wanna think about this stuff in the context of our CrossFit program, right? So if we're gonna be doing accessory work outside of the program that I program for you guys, we wanna start least with a minimum effective volume. And that minimum effective volume is gonna be different depending on the muscle group you're trying to use. So, do you think a bigger muscle group has a lower minimum effective volume or a higher minimum effective volume? Higher. You said higher, mm -hmm. why? I don't know. <laughs> it's a bigger muscle yeah. well, so it's, stronger, right? it's actually the opposite. So, a bigger muscle group has a lower minimum effective volume, oh. right? So, because the muscle's bigger, it takes more time to recover, right? So if you're talking about a muscle like a quad, like your quads or your chest or your back, or your back's a muscle groups, but your back as a whole, and it's gonna take more effort to recover. So the volume you have to do to hit it is gonna be a lot lower to start because you're doing so much work when you're hitting it, and it's taking so much to recover that we're gonna start, so, so let's say you're using 10 sets for quads. It might be your minimum effective volume. So what minimum effective volume really means is it's the least amount of work that you can do to still progress that muscle. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now a muscle that's a lot smaller, like a bicep or a side delt or a rear delt, something like that, might have a higher minimum effective volume. It might be like 15 or 20 sets. It might be the minimum amount of volume you need to do in order to stimulate that muscle because it's so small, it recovers so fast. Make sense? Same thing with your forearms or your calves. Muscles that you're using all the time that you're thinking about is you're walking. So if you get 10,000 steps a day, that's 10,000 calf rings. Right? Or 5,000 on each leg, whatever it is. Okay, so you're doing a lot of work on that muscle group all the time, so it has a very high load tolerance. So you said like 10 sets for, say, quads. Yeah. Would that be 10 sets to failure for every muscle group? So it would be 10 sets to between three to zero reps away from failure. Okay. okay. And again, that needs to be used a weight that stimulates that muscle. So it can't be like three sets of 10 with like, 50% of your water max. That might not be enough weight to stimulate that muscle group. It's gonna be a challenging set of 10 or a challenging set of that's gonna cause that muscle to grow. Okay, it can't just be like, oh, I'm just gonna do three sets of leg extensions at like 20 pounds and then a day. That make sense? So, once you've established your MEV, and that can be done through trial and error, so basically you can start a weekend, I'm gonna do, say I'm gonna do 10 sets of quads this week. If you're sore and you recover, so say you do five sets on Monday, three sets on Wednesday, you do two sets on Friday, and at the end of the week, you're like, wow, my quads are really sore. And they're sore again until the next Monday, that's probably a good minimum effective volume for you. Mm -hmm. If you do five sets on Monday, three sets on Wednesday, two sets on Friday, and then like you're totally fine to go by Saturday, you're like, wow, I feel fine. Like, that means you can probably increase the amount of sets. And you can establish a higher minimum effective Not volume. Not the weight, just the set. The well, you can, you can do sets or weight, okay? But usually if we're, if we're using a weight, we're not getting sore from that weight or not experiencing a good pump or stimulus from that, we generally want to increase the sets first and then increase the weight second. Okay. Yes. Can you still be getting a good stimulus of moving work correctly without getting really sore? Yes, yeah. So we consider like a good stimulus muscle disruption. So soreness is a form of muscle disruption. Cramping is a soreness of muscle disruption. So it might not be like you're super sore the next like day you train that muscle group, but like, that could be a good indication. Or just general like achiness. Like, okay, my muscle's not super sore, but my body just feels tired and achy. That could be a good sign of muscle disruption. Or, is that bad? <laughs> no, that's good. That means you're stimulating the muscle appropriately enough to get the growth. I know this is a tangent, but if you feel that soreness, should you drink more water? Like, what's the response if your whole body is achy? So if your whole body is achy, you want to look at your nutrition and make sure you're eating enough calories to support your activity. Because again, sleep and nutrition are the two biggest of recovery. So you make sure you're sleeping seven to nine hours a night, make sure you're eating enough calories to support your activity. That's gonna help you recover more than any supplement or any amino acid or anything you can buy that's gonna help you recover faster. Nothing's gonna beat sleep and eating, okay? So why if you stop hurting and aching? That means have increased? Yeah, so okay, your body's very adaptive, right? So your body is 
so it says, like we said before, we did 3 sets of 10 and 100 pounds in a squat every single, every single week for the rest of our lives. Eventually, we have no more stimulus from that. Our body is very good at adapting to the stress that's put upon it. So, we get to the point where we need to add weight or add load, we need to do that, okay, or continue to progress that muscle. You can't just keep expecting to do the same weights and the same reps and the same thing every single time in order to continue to progress. It's not going to happen. If it did happen, there'd be people squatting 1,000 pounds. Every, everyone in this gym would be squatting 1,000 pounds. Right. <laughs> just keep progressing and progressing and progressing, but eventually it'll work. Make sense? So once we've established our MEV, we're going to talk about isolation versus compound movement for leg muscle. So what is isolation movement? That's holding. Nope. No, no. just one muscle is being oh, yeah. okay. so Generally speaking, like one muscle group is being used predominantly. Mm -hmm. So like a single for instance, like a leg extension would be a quad isolation movement. As opposed to a squat, which would be a compound leg stretch or a compound quad stretch. So when we're discussing bringing up a leg and muscle group in the context of a CrossFit setting, if we're doing that. So if I was to, if you're coming to me and say, Pat, I want need a program to develop my triceps or develop my quads or develop my hips or hamstrings, or whatever it is. Um, would, I, would it make a lot of sense for me to give you guys an isolation movement or a compound movement? Well, if you're asking for one thing, isolation would be yeah. better. Right? Isolation is oftentimes better in this any idea why? Because we do compounds all the time. Yeah, so we're doing a ton of compound movements in class, right? right. We always do no isolation movements in class. Right. Okay. So when we're trying to big, bring up a lag in muscle group, isolation is going to be better because we're able to more focus and target that specific muscle group. And that's going to bring us into SFR. Anyone know what that means? It's okay, I didn't write this anywhere. It's stimulus to fatigue ratio, mm -hmm. right? So how much stimulus are you getting and how much fatigue are you building during that stimulus? What do you think is a higher SFR, isolation or compound movements? Isolation. Compound, compound right? Compound, yes. So a bigger, a bigger movement that involves more muscle groups is gonna cause more fatigue. Yeah. So what's more fatiguing? If I was to say, put Diana on the kneeling hamstring curl, and have her do three sets of 10, or have her do three sets of 10 deadlifts? Both are going to hit her hamstring, right? But she's going to be more sore from the deadlifts because the load's going to be relatively heavier because she's going to do more weight because it's not isolating that specific muscle. Right. And, and there's going to be more muscles being used. So she's not just using your hamstring, she's using your glutes, she's using your quads, she's using your back. So in this context of developing an accessory work program in this CrossFit setting, and this would be a different story if you're just like, I want to get bigger. I don't care if you're doing CrossFit, I want to get bigger. It's a different story. In this specific setting, we're going to want to use isolation movements order to improve the muscle group as opposed to compound movements because the SFR, the stimulus to fatigue ratio, is going to be lower for isolation movements as than it would be for compound movements. So I see a lot of people after class like jump on a bar, squatting, or doing bench press, or doing a strict press, or like great in theory, but what happens if we're doing, say I do three sets ten back squats after a workout, and then we have to do 150 wall ball right. Now we're, now we're getting past that MEV, right? The minimum effective volume. And we're getting towards that MRV, which is what we're going to talk about here, which is maximum recoverable bar machine. That's really what that should be, MRV. Not MVR. Anyway, did I write it wrong? You did write it wrong. It's okay. So that should be MRV, not MVR. Or MVR. So that's the maximum recoverable bar. That's as much work as you can do in a given week to week basis. MRV? Maximum recoverable volume. So it's the most amount of work you can do while still being able to recover from that work. Mm. Does that make sense? So that might be like 20 sets for quads, mm. maybe the most 25. But then for smaller muscle groups, it could be higher. These are just 30 sets for a move like a side delt or something like that. That might be really weak as opposed to the quads which are really big and really strong. Okay? But we need to think about this in the context of the class. So if we're doing a really heavy set of squats on Monday and doing a thruster workout, we have to look at that and that's part of our total volume for quads in a week, right? So we did one, say, so what did we do this week on squats? Do you remember, was it 10 rep max? It was 10 rep max. Yes. So we did one really heavy set of 10 for that 10 rep max. And then afterwards we did a workout that involved um, like hang power cleans and yeah. squats? Um, it was something max effort, wasn't it? It was max effort hang power cleans. Yeah, it was 15. Yeah, so, we did, so right there they we did. hang, we did them from the floor. Oh yeah, they were, no, they were touch and go. Touch and go, right? Oh yeah. So, when we think about this, we have to think, okay, on Monday we're squatting. So we have at least between one and three sets of squats on Monday. So if we wanted to squat again, 
when would we want to do it? Potentially. Yeah. Wednesday, they're not the next day. It's a big month. Well. So it's, it's going to, so I mean, I asked the question, but it really says, the answer really depends on the person, right? Because do, if we're really sore from squatting and stuff on Monday, do we want to squat again if we're still sore on Wednesday? No. No, right? So it's really going to depend on how adapted you are to the program and how much or how well you're recovering from the program. So if I'm squatting on Monday, I'm super sore on Tuesday, I feel ready to go again on Wednesday, Wednesday's your day to squat again after class for accessories or do leg extensions or something. It's going to be less like, compound on your entire body and more focused on the muscle group you're trying to hit. Okay? And that, that works the same for every muscle group, right? Because again, some of them have really low MRV or MEVs and some of them have really high MEVs depending on the muscle group. So a movement, a quad movement, you might need only to do a couple times a week. When we're, when we're discussing in terms of frequency, which we're going to talk about over here, the more frequently you can hit a muscle group, the better. Okay, because upwards of three or four times a week will cause that muscle to grow. That's only in the context that you're recovering enough between those sessions in order to stimulate that growth again. Okay, so what would be, what would be bad is if we hit, say, quads on Monday, we're really sore on Tuesday, we're not so sore on Wednesday, we're ready to go on Thursday, but then we don't train quads again until Saturday. So we just miss two days, potential growth days that we could have for that muscle group. Does that make sense? Do you have any questions over there? I, I was, I'm just surprised. I, I was, uh, I thought like we only needed to work a muscle group like once or twice a week at most. Um, and if you completely annihilate a muscle group, you might need to. So if you say, say you have 25 sets of quads you do in a week, and you do them all on Monday. Yeah, but we never do that. We I know, never, we never, I'm not saying it, but if you did that, you might, you might be sore, until Saturday, okay? You might, you might be like, oh my God, I came to sit on the toilet right now. And then, and then the next day you'd wanna train your quads would be Saturday. But then if you're waiting until Monday, you're missing out on two days that you could have for growth, okay? So again, we wanna hit muscles as frequently as we can, assuming that we're recovering between sessions. Does that make sense? So if you keep working on through your pain, that's yeah. not good either? It's not good because you're not allowing the muscle to grow. Or not, not like the muscles to recover and grow. They do that. I do 100 squats every day thinking that it's going to work out. And I, I'm hurt, but I'm like, I have to do this. Yeah. So, so that's not the most optimal way to approach growing a muscle. Okay. I mean, you'll still burn calories and stuff like that. And if, if your goal is like weight loss or something like that and you want to burn extra calories, sure. But again, you're not doing yourself any favors by destroying a muscle and then repeatedly destroying that muscle mm -hmm. over and over mm -hmm. and over again. If anything, you're going to delay that recovery and that's gonna, the muscle's not going to grow as much because instead the muscle's going to get more endurance effect. So instead of growing the muscle, you're getting the muscle more conditioned, which means you actually have to do more work later to make the muscle grow. Mm -hmm. So think about like a runner. Runners have a really good slow twitch muscle fiber, right? So it means that their muscles are really good at moving really long distances over a long period of time. As opposed to like a power lifter, which has a really high, like, um, I forget myself working for a second, oh my god. They really have fast twitch muscle fiber. Mm -hmm. So really high fast, which means they're really good at exploding really fast. So like one rep squat, like they blow out of the bottom even if they grind a little bit, it's like really hard, but they're able to get through it. They're probably not the best at running because mm -hmm. they're really good at exploding. Mm -hmm. So if you are constantly doing endurance type stuff, like 100 squats every single day, you're developing a lot of muscular endurance in that muscle, but you're not necessarily making the muscle bigger. So my butt's not gonna get big. Not necessarily. Dang, so <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's Best the way it works. Wow. Yes. Yes. With the, How much bigger do you want? With the crazy yeah. settings, yeah. 100 squats a day. You can't because I've done CrossFit and I've done just like personal training. Mm -hmm. You can't really grow your muscles in a CrossFit setting, right? Because we're, like you talk about isolation and we do a lot of compound movements, but like if our goal is to get bigger, we have to do more than just what we do in CrossFit, So right? not necessarily. If your goal is to get bigger, that, that's more of a diet effect, right? So you need to make sure you're eating enough calories to support yourself. The way I write the program is there's a strength component of the program, there's a power component of the program, and there's an endurance component of the program. So if you're eating a correct amount to put on weight and put on size, and you're doing the compound lifts, and you're getting stronger in those lifts, and you're periodizing and progressively overloading them, you're gonna build muscle, you're gonna get stronger. Okay. Especially when we're hitting those higher rep ranges, like in the first part of our cycles that we're doing right, right now, where we started with 20, 15s, 10s, 8s, 6s, you're gonna get hypertrophy through all those phases. Once we get about under five reps, probably not building hypertrophy anymore, so when there's not enough time under tension, and there's not enough mechanical tension, and there's not enough load and volume to stimulate that growth, but you are gonna stimulate the strength of the muscles. The muscles are gonna get stronger, but it's not necessarily gonna get bigger. But if we have a 16-week back squat program, and the first 
12 weeks in that program or all hypertrophy range, you have 12 weeks to grow your muscle, assuming that you're eating enough calories and you're sleeping enough to recover. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So if I, if my quads are really sore, yeah. some, for some reason I have it in my head, I should then go for like a long walk or something. Totally so, fine. And that's not gonna... Totally fine. Like the recovery? Yeah, like, yeah. A reco like yeah. Active, active recovery. recovery. So active recovery can be a double-edged sword, okay? Active recovery is great, and I recommend everyone try to get at least 10,000 steps a day, okay? That's just a good benchmark for health, that you're walking at least like four and a half miles a day, because again, that's gonna get some flushing around, it's gonna help you recover. When it's not active recovery, you're like, I'm gonna go for a two mile run. Like, that's causing more damage. That's not, that's, that's like Boz who carries his seat <laughs> around everywhere. It's like, it's not, it's not doing him any favors, and it's not allowing him to recover, because that's a load and a stimulus, right? So it's not enough load to build strength or to build hypertrophy, but it's enough load to cause muscular endurance adaptation. What happens is you continue to do those kind of adaptations where you're, again, focusing on longer durations and more endurance stuff, your actually muscle fiber can actually switch types. So it can actually move from more predominantly fast twitch to more predominantly slow twitch, mm -hmm. which makes muscle building a lot harder because now you have to load it a lot heavier and you need to be able to push through harder reps, which you can't necessarily do because you don't have those fast twitch muscle fibers. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. hmm. Questions? Any other questions before we move on? All right, cool. So let's talk about building a program to bring up lagging body parts. So the first thing I'm going to say about that is we can only generally try to hit one lagging muscle group at a time. Okay? Anything more, especially in a CrossFit setting, is going to be very difficult to do. Fuck, I was like, I can't even, I have like about six things I need to say. <laughs> right. so, so, so one thing at a time, and I recommend doing that thing for upwards of 16 to 20 weeks, okay? with, little, with little breaks in there, in between. So little deloads in there, and we'll talk about how to deload and some of that later. So generally 16 to 20 weeks, hitting that muscle with as much frequency as you can handle. So again, if you're saying we're talking about triceps on a bench press, if I can hit my triceps on Monday and they're recovered by Wednesday, can again on Wednesday, and they're recovered again by Friday, hit them on Friday, they feel okay on Saturday, I can hit them again on Saturday four times a week, I feel like perfect. I can hit that muscle four times a week, boom, boom, boom. Next week everything feels good, I increase sets of reps, and then I go back and, and I keep doing that until I start to feel fatigue to the point where I'm not progressing. And that would be a sign that, okay, Talk about how to do in a second. But that's generally how I would start. And how would I structure my sets and reps for a lagging muscle group? Anyone know? So that comes back to our MEV, right? So our minimum effective volume. So we know from what I've told you guys that the effective muscle, the effective, effective rep range for hypertrophy is over or five or over reps and up to 30 reps is gonna be kind of like the maximum before you get to that muscular endurance. So, so five to 30 reps, and we start with the minimum effective volume. We have to refine that. So we start with, say, start with two exercises for triceps on Monday, wait to see when we recover, and then say we recover by Wednesday, we'll do another two, get to Friday, we're recovered, another two, feel okay on Saturday still, another two, that's eight sets. If I feel totally fine by Monday, again, we go again, now we go up to three sets, three and two. Three and two, three and two. Now on Saturday, I'm like, oh, I'm a little sore, okay? Maybe we only do one working set on Saturday, but we make it a higher rep set. So 20 to 30 reps as opposed to, say, 10 to 20 reps, okay? Now we've increased our sets. Now by Monday, I'm ready to go again. If the weights feel good and I'm progressing in reps and progressing in weight, I can increase sets or I can increase reps, okay? So you give yourself a rep range. Generally speaking, for isolation movements, we want to stick between the 10 to 20 rep range. Sometimes going as high as 30, but never really that five to 10 rep. Because we're isolating the move, we're isolating the muscle group, it's gonna be more dangerous to go heavier on an isolation move than we'll be on a compound move. So if we were trying to hit the, say, close grip bench press for triceps, we could load that in that five to 10 rep range, but if we're doing like a tricep push down on a camp machine, we wouldn't really wanna go that heavy. Does make sense? Because you're not using as much muscle, the risk for tearing that muscle is a lot easier if you're doing an isolation movement, as opposed, or as a compound movement as opposed to an isolation movement. Does that make sense? So, once we talk about that, we talk about frequency versus intensity. So, what's the difference between frequency and intensity? Frequency is how many times, mm -hmm. and intensity, intensity is how hard. How hard, right? Mm -hmm. So there's tons of ways to train, okay? In this particular setting, I prefer frequency over intensity. Because imagine, like I've been training with Elizabeth for the last couple weeks, we've been doing a more intensity-focused training as opposed to volume-focused training. We were doing volume before that. 
So we built her up enough volume where we were then able to do intensity techniques. So intensity techniques would be like a drop set where I do like, say I stack that machine, I start doing push downs at 100 pounds. And once I hit failure, I then drop it to 90 pounds and throw the failure and drop to 80 pounds for the failure. Or we can do giant sets where we can stack multiple exercises on top of each other and do them over and over and over again. Those are more for like, if you're not doing CrossFit. <laughs> okay, they don't, they don't really have a place in a CrossFit accessory program structure because we're already getting so much intensity to do our workouts of the day. Okay, so if you just did 150 push-ups in a workout and you want to hit triceps now, like do you really want to like throw intensity techniques in there or just do three or four sets of 10, 20 reps, call it a day, right? So when we're speaking about volume, Right, and intensity, we really want to focus more on the volume aspect for CrossFit specifically. Because again, the intensity is already going to happen through that workout a day. Make sense? If you, if you just want to just do strictly bodybuilding or strictly trying to get bigger, you can talk about throwing intensity techniques in there once in a while. But generally speaking, for CrossFit setting, volume is the only way to really go. Questions about that? Cool. So we then we talk about this earlier, start with AEV, start with that minimum effective volume, and then increase sets and reps as we need to. So if we're doing, we'll talk about quad now. So say we're doing leg extensions for quad. Is that why, I'm just curious. Hmm? So is that why like over the <coughs> years I've been here, like my volume has really gotten, I would say, a lot better. I mean, not that my weights haven't improved too, mm -hmm. but I would say my volume's gotten a lot better, significantly more than just like, than like maximum weight. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Because again, your body adapts to the stress that you put upon it. So MEV, so minimum effective volume, can start at 10 sets. Okay, but that doesn't mean it's gonna stay 10 sets. So for, for instance, if you're training like triceps for 16 weeks trying to become bigger and stronger, and you're taking breaks in between, so I say four, you do four weeks, you take one week deload, another four weeks, one week deload. By the time you get to that third mesocycle, that third active month period where you're hitting those muscles with that, with that intensity, like your MEV might be like 15 or 20 sets as opposed to that 10 sets it was originally because you're adapting to that volume, right? Does that make sense? So the more you adapt, the higher those starting points are gonna be. So Pete just made a good argument where in the beginning his volume wasn't very high, but now he's adapted to a much higher volume to be able to handle more load over a longer period of time. So if, it, if when he started, he might need to take a break from training after two or three weeks, now he can do five or six weeks to take a break from training because his body's more adapted to that training style. Does that make sense? Any other questions? Cool. So we're gonna use isolation movements, start with MEV, use isolation movements. Again, if we're doing triceps, we're gonna focus on push downs, stuff like cable machines that are gonna be very minimal stress everywhere else in your body. Stay away from combat movements like close grip bench press or like barbell stuff or any kind of like, anything that's gonna cause a lot of damage to other places besides just the tricep, okay? And this is where we really wanna focus on technique. So we talked about this when we started, is so what is the primary function of the muscle? Okay, so let's talk about the tricep again, we were just talking about before. So what does the tricep do? That's the elbow, right? Okay. So what do we do to lengthen that tricep? Uh, if this contracts the tricep, right. so you're bending up, right? right? So we want to, we, when we're thinking about what movements are going to be best, especially in isolation, for developing a muscle group, we want to think about what's going to get my muscle group in the best position to lengthen and the best position to contract. Okay. So we want to think about that as what joint is it connected to? So for a tricep, it's connected to the elbows and the shoulder. So I want to get as much flexion, so as much closing this angle as close as I can get it in the elbow as possible in order to maximally lengthen this muscle. Once the muscle is maximally lengthened, I can then contract it very hard, and then I let it lengthen again, come all the way back up, and contract it very hard on the way down. That's yeah. oh, Okay, so speaking of tricep extension, mm -hmm. so I've seen uh, the, the skull pressure, right, mm -hmm. that, and, but then I've also seen people take like a weight and put it behind their head and stuff like that. Is there one that's like preferred or So, so what you're discussing is different angles. Oh, okay. So you want to hit the muscle in a bunch of angles. The minimum amount of um, exercises you want to do for a, a given muscle group on a day is probably about two, okay? There are, there are exceptions like your back because your back is so big and it's so many different muscle groups and you hit from a bunch of different angles. So back's usually about three or maybe four exercises to hit the back in all the different angles that it needs to be hit in. But generally speaking, about two exercises, two or three exercises can hit the muscle in enough angles to hit all the aspects of the muscle. Okay, so your lat, for instance, so you have pull, anybody have children pull-ups? Like strict pull-ups? Yeah. So your lat has got so many different angles to hit it from. Like there's too many different planes your lat moves through. Okay, 
guys, because your lat music wraps around your forward pitch and takes a large portion of your back. So we can pull down for our back, we can row into us for our back, we can retract the shoulder blades, we can depress the shoulder blades, and all different aspects of our back are going to get hit through all this movement. Okay? That's why we have so many different back machines in here, because they each serve a different function, right? Because the lat is made up of multiple segments. And hitting those different segments is going to be depending on what angle you're at and what movement you're doing, whether you're rowing or pulling down or pulling up on the bar. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, like, for instance, like a back would be like, you might need like four, four movements for a back, but for a tricep, you may only need two. Because the tricep's got three heads on it, but they're all working really hard together at the same time. So, like an overhead tricep move where you're extending the elbow behind your head, getting a really big stretch through here, and then contracting overhead, and then it'd be a push down movement where you're pushing down, contracting, coming back up and flexing. Questions about your lesson. Would dips even be considered an isolation because you're kind of using your pecs too? So I wouldn't consider a dip isolation movement unless it was like a machine dip. We don't have one of those, but like if you had those, you know, you sit on the bench or you sit on a weight stack and you push down like that, that would be like a isolation movement for the tricep because you can really focus on what angle you're putting it at. You can make tr you can make dips more tricep focused, but there's always going to be that pec in there too. So if you're trying to grow the triceps in isolation, I wouldn't use the pec as a primary. Or is our dip as a primary mover. Make sense? Cool. All right, so then we're going to monitor our sets and reps uh, via periodization. So what does periodization mean? But I think it means that you have a program for like six weeks and then you change it. So periodization, periodization just means progressing over time, essentially, okay. right? So we're going to monitor our periodization for our program that we're going to write for ourselves is going to be by how many reps am I doing and how much load am I doing? Okay. Sets can also play a rep, uh, or sets can also play a part in that. But generally speaking, it's gonna be, all right, I started week one, two sets of 100 pounds on the bench press. Okay, for, not for generalization. Okay, I did two sets of 10. Okay, my, my rep range was five to 10. I was able to get 10 on both those sets, no problem. What do I need to do next week? One, either, either load or volume. Yeah, so I either need to go for more reps so to try to get 12 reps on each set or 15 reps on each set, or I need to increase the load. So say the next week I do 105 and I get two sets of 12. What does that tell us? You can go up in weight. I can go up in weight next time, because if my rep range was five to 10 reps and I'm exceeding that rep range, it means I'm not going heavy enough. Right. So then the following so. week, I'm like, all right, fuck it, we're gonna go for it, 115. I get a set of eight, and the second set I get a set of six. Are we good? No. No, we're good, right? Because we, we hit within the rep range, the five oh, to 10 reps. Yeah, so we, we hit five to 10, or, and we hit the first set, we got eight, second set, we got six, totally fine. My chest is pumped, nice and sore the next day, we're good to go. Next week, I do the same thing, I get nine and I get seven. We're still good to go? Still in that range, yeah. yeah cool, yeah, we're still good to go. The following week, I get 10 and I get eight, but I'm not that sore the next day, or I don't feel any kind of disruption in my muscles. You need to you need you need so we can either increase the load again, or we can increase the amount of sets we're doing. So maybe the following week, I do the same weight again, 115, I get 11, which is a little too high, and I get nine, and the last set I get six, okay? And I'm sore as fuck the next day. That's good, okay? It means I get, I mean, that one set of 11, I'm getting the world to one set over our working set we're trying to hit, and then the other two were in that same rep range, and I got a good pump, and my chest felt good, and I was sore the next day, and by the next day after that, I was ready to go again and hit chest again. Next time I hit chest, I'll say I do like a dumbbell incline instead of doing a flat bench. And I'm hitting good weights, I do two sets, and I'm not that sore the next day. Okay, increase the weight, increase the sets. Well, these are all your things you need to monitor in order to continue to progress, right? You can't just like throw the same way in the barber beef, expect to grow, right? You gotta increase the sets, increase the reps, increase the weight, and not all at the same time, okay? <laughs> that's, 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 I don't mean you to do that all. It's the same movement. You can increase any one of those three to continue to progress periodize your training. So if your reps are going up, if your weight's going up, if your volume's going up, all good indications that you're driving the temperature. And then at that point, so make sure you're recovering properly so that by the time you're, you're good to go again, you're ready to hit a similar volume to the end before. Okay? We want to make sure we're staying within that MRV, MVR, the maximum recovery volume. Because by the end of the week, say we hit the quads Monday, Wednesday, Friday, those are our three volume days. If by Monday the next week, not ready to go again means you're not hitting that max, you're hitting more than that max recovery volume. So at that point, you might need to pull down your sets or pull down your frequency in order to continue to grow. Because again, we don't want to be like flip flopping every day of the week and see, well, okay, we're going to do this this day. 
then wait till the next day, and then like, okay. Eventually you're gonna get, so it'll be second issue next time, so three years soon. Okay, I know that after two days, I'm pretty much good to go. My volume's too high, and I'm not good to go after those two days. That means I need to reassess what I'm doing, or maybe take it. Okay, sorry, this is tangent. But you know how some people say that they're like a hard Yes. Yeah, so. I just had a discussion yesterday. There is no such thing as a hard gear. I mean, people that don't know how to eat correctly. Like, yeah, some people's metabolism are faster than others, but like, any, anytime someone comes to me and like, like I'll, I'll give you guys a little tangent example of this. I had a roommate in college, this guy Tom. I had to be like 140 pounds soaking wet, like five foot six. And he's like, dude, I can eat whatever I want and I'll never gain any weight. And I'd be like, all right, like, how much are you eating a day? He's like, I'm having a pizza every single day. I'm like, cool. So you're having 2,000 calories every day for a pizza. It's like, that's all you're having. It's like, yeah, but maybe I'll have some ice cream. It's like, 2,500 calories. It's like, have you tried to go to 3,000 calories? It's like, well, I can't eat anymore. It's like, pizza, but that's because you're picking stupid food to eat. If you were to, like, pick more protein and, and food that digests like, faster, yeah. like, that's a lot less fat in it, then you're going to be able to eat more frequently, and you're going to put on weight. So, so, I, so okay, so please devil devil's yeah. advocate with you. What about people who are, like, string beans? Like, they are so skinny, and... They are, they are eating versus people who are like husky, who have like a, a larger body and it, it's like natural to their body. I mean, I guess it's just body type. Yeah, yeah, body type for sure, definitely plays a role in it. Yeah. Again, your metabolism can be fast or slow, okay? It does not matter. Okay. If you're eating correctly to lose or gain weight, you're going to. So if I put you in a 500 calorie week surplus, or I put you in a 500 calorie deficit, no matter what, physics is physics. You're gonna okay. lose weight or gain weight, no matter what. Okay, your metabolism might be faster, but that just means that I miscalculated your maintenance calories. So if you're, if you tell me you're eating 2,000 calories every single day, and I put you at 2,100, and you didn't gain a single pound after a week, that means that you lied to me. Well, you, might, you, might not have lied, you might not have lied to me, but you, you, mis, you misunderstood what your maintenance calories were. So you might be like, oh yeah, you're like, I just guessed that I was eating 2,000 calories a day. But really, you're eating 2,100 calories a day to maintain your body weight, in which case I should have put you at 3,000 instead of putting you at 2,500. Okay. So you're about losing weight. But, oh, I can't lose weight no matter what I do. It's like, track your calories for a week and then see what your maintenance level is. So if you're X weight on Monday and you're X weight again the following Monday, that means if you add up all those calories that you ate from Monday to Monday and you divide it by seven, that's your maintenance calories, okay? Like, it could be 3,000, it could be 2,000, it could be 1,000. Some people's bodies get really slow and then they're, like, if they're not eating enough, you guys should put on more body fat because your body's like. I was just gonna ask you, can you put on weight Yes, you can. But like, it's, it's not going to be the way you think. Like, so you said, like, the number on the scale is not going to change. No, right. But your body's going to look doughier than someone else's body. Gotcha. Easy way to put it. Because you're going to preferentially store any excess you have as calories, or as fat calories. So you'll sort of. You're burning it. calories and not replenishing. Your body starts to, to what? Hold on. So. So say, say you eat like a thousand calories a day, mm -hmm. but you're like super sedentary. So maybe you burn like 500 calories a day just from like living your life and like existing. Mm -hmm. Like your body's functioning for a thousand calories a day. You're still at a 500 calorie day surplus, right? Okay. So after seven days, that's still 300 extra calories that you need. So you'll put on fat. You might not notice it because you're already fat, mm -hmm. but you, you'll, you'll notice that your body composition will actually change to be more like softer and doughy because you're getting preferentially storing. So you're not eating enough calories to basically like support your metabolic functions. So your body's like, well, we gotta store this, this fat because we don't know when the next meal's coming or we don't know if we're getting enough nutrition to support our activity level. We're gonna try to store as much as we can as fat as opposed to like turning into protein synthesis, muscles, mTOR is getting activated, all those fancy fucking slags and terms. Any other questions before we move on? It sounds all so complicated. It does. It, it, it's it, well, it is a science. It's a lot. It's a science. It's a to like, to I mean, believe me, I wish it was easier. Food for me overwhelms me. Like, I don't eat bad, I just don't eat enough. And, it's and, like, and, and that's, that's the problem that most people have. So, yeah. I'll, you'd be amazed at how many people that are like 100 pounds overweight come to me for diets and they're eating like 1,500 calories a day. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why I'm not losing weight. Right. It's because, well, you're not active enough and you're not eating enough to support your metabolism. So, like, again, if you're not eating enough to support, like, so say you're, you're, so you're 300 pounds, okay, big guy, right? How much energy do you think it takes for me to walk around at 200 pounds as opposed to someone that takes right. 300 pounds? It takes them a lot more energy to just move their body. 
Mm-hmm. This is why bigger people are generally more sedentary. Because the more they move around, the more tired they get. They're like, I don't want to move around anymore. <laughs> like, but when they, they lose weight, they tend to have like really big legs because their legs need to be really big to support their fucking whole bodies moving around. Mm-hmm. But yeah. also, the more you work out, the less hungry you get. I mean, mentally, oh, yeah. because you're like, I don't want to eat that much after working so much, like sacrificing myself. Like, how do you? So, I think that's like, I think that's like a mindset. So we're, we're, going, we're, 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 going, we're going on a little bit of a tangent here, <laughs> which I'm okay with. But well, working out is, is, a, is a cortisol response, right? So when you work out, your body is under stress, and your cortisol level rises as you work out. Cortisol is actually a catabolic hormone, right? So cortisol is going to tell your body to, to not build muscle. So anabolic is building muscle. Catabolic is, is taking away muscle. So you actually build muscle while you're working out. You build it while you recover. So basically what's working out is doing is causing a fight or flight response in your body, right? So imagine like someone walks into a gun and is like, I'm gonna shoot every single person here. All of a sudden, all of our brains would be like, do we run or do we, or do we fight this guy? Like, yeah. like, do we stay and try to fight it or do we get the fuck out of here? And that's essentially what's happening to your body at a workout. When you finish your workout, your body's like, oh my God, like what the hell's happening? Yeah. Like, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm tense everywhere. Like I, I feel like I just like rained down a fucking cheetah. Like I'm tackling the ground. Like, <laughs> but you don't think of a neck in that. Yeah, but your body doesn't know the difference, right? So your body, like if you're, if you're tackling a buffalo, trying to kill it, or you're back squatting 400 pounds, your body's got no idea what's, what's happening. Your body, like, you have an idea because you have a brain and you have eyes, you can see, but you're inside your body, all it knows is tension and stress. That's why the primary drivers are hurt your muscular tension and load. Because your body does not know how much weight you're lifting. If you put 400 pounds on a back squat, you squat down and stand up, your body doesn't know it's 400 pounds. Your body just knows it's tension, right? Same thing if a car falls on you. Like, you can try to bench press a car off you, and like, maybe you could do it if you're like, you're like a super adrenaline rush and you're able to drive it up, but your body doesn't know it's a car. Your body's just like, oh, there's something pushing down on me, and I'm trying to resist that, and I'm getting tension through that muscle. But your body has no idea how much weight is up to you. That's why it doesn't matter if you increase the weight or increase the reps, right? Because your body doesn't know if it's 400 pounds, but if I did five reps to 400 pounds one week, and I did six reps the next week, and your body shows that was more tension than I was under before. This is why diet and working out Go ahead. goes in hand because yeah. you recover and your muscle grows with you what yeah. you put in your body, your rest, your diet. Exactly. So back to, back to the initial point I was making before, because again, we don't have a couple tangents here. When you're done working out, your body is, is in that fight or flight response. The first thing you want to do after a workout is you want to try to relax. You want to try to bring yourself back to baseline. So you want to try to basically relax as much as you can, turn off that fight or flight response, which will stop the catabolic effects of cortisol from happening. And at that point, cortisol, so, so again, someone walks in with a gun, points it at all of us, I'm gonna shoot you guys, you think gotta run or fight me. You think you're gonna feel hungry during that point? No, no. No, right, you'd be like, <laughs> like, oh my God. It's not a priority. <laughs> it's not a priority, right? Your body's prioritizing your survival okay. over your hunger. So it's the faster you can come down off of that high from the workout, that fight or flight response from a workout, the faster you're gonna be able to eat and be able to recover and be able to rest. So you go from fight or flight to rest and recover or rest and relax. So you want to try to down-regulate that cortisol, which means you guys are taking deep breaths, trying to relax, not thinking about stressful things going on in your day, just trying to bring yourself back to homeostasis is going to basically allow you to be hungrier after you work out. I mean, I, I have the opposite effect sometimes where I'll work out really hard and be like, I'm fucking starving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's because I'm pretty efficient with my workouts and I've been doing this enough time. You right don't, because I'm mentally like, I just worked out, I don't want to eat. Yeah, and that, that's another thing that intensity does to workouts, is the more intense workout is, so the crossfit style workout, the higher that cortisol spike's gonna be. So if I'm just lifting weights and you guys are doing crossfit workouts, like I can downregulate from lifting weights very quickly because I know I can, by taking enough breaths and I can downregulate my breathing and I can get everything back to control. But after workouts, how many of you were like thinking like, I can just focus on my breathing as opposed to just laying on the ground? <laughs> right? So the faster you can bring yourself back to homeostasis and switch over from fight or flight to rest and recover, the more quickly that hunger is going to come back to you. Like, mm-hmm. Your body's going to be like, oh yeah, I just worked out. Like, well, again, it's going to work out. Your body's like, I should just be physical. I should probably get some nutrition in order to get rid of that catalog. So as soon as you finish your workout, you generally want to have some fast acting carbohydrates. Just feel like sugar. Again, it's not like you don't want to have it all the time, but the best time to have it after workout, so you feel like having some gummy bears or something like that. As soon as you work out, get like 10 to 20 grams of carbs from you really quick. And I get like 10 to 20 grams of protein or amino acids from you really quick. And that should just satiate you and turn off that effect of catabolicness after mm-hmm. a workout and start getting your body towards building muscle anabolic as opposed to taking away muscle. Okay, because again, we don't build muscle in the gym. We build muscle while we're sleeping and while we're eating at home. Mm-hmm. 
So if we don't build muscle, and I mean, and I've heard this lots of times, since until you're sleeping, what difference does it make if you eat after you, like, because typically, especially like on a Saturday or something, yeah. we'll work out at 10 I, or whatever. I won't, I won't eat until 1 or 2. Like, yeah. does that make a big difference? I'm not building muscle um, anymore. As, as long as you're eating within like two hours, for instance, of workout, that's probably, that's kind of like the, the magic window. The reason that we're trying to put calories into our body, especially like carbohydrates and little protein into our bodies after they work out, is because we want to, again, signal our body to stop the catabolic effect. So as soon as that cortisol spikes up, your body's like, I'm very, I'm very catabolic right now, so I'm very much tearing down muscle. Because the muscle just got broken down in the workout, my body's trying to flush all that muscle, the dead muscle cells out of my body. But its priority is, is moving the muscle out, like dead muscle out of your body, not building new muscle. So the faster we can get carbohydrates and protein synthesis occurring in the muscle, the faster we can start repairing that muscle and the better our recovery is going to be. So if I, and what about, because typically, you know, I mean, for the most part, I'd sort of eat a little carnivore. Yeah. So if today, typically, I would go home and have like four eggs and uh, half a pound of ground beef mm -hmm. and maybe some cheese, and I wouldn't even eat any carbs until I might have something at dinner or something. But mm -hmm. And that's a hit or miss too. So is that protein synthesis good? is fueled by amino acids and protein. So protein after workout's fine. What you don't want to generally have after a workout is a lot of fat. And the reason is not the reason you think, I know fat's a lot of calories and stuff like that, but it just slows down your digestion. Right? Because fat is not utilized for energy. It's not utilized, I mean it's used for hormone production, but it's not used for energy production. So the more fat you eat, the slower your digestion is because your body's not used to using fat as an energy source. Your body might be because you do carnivore all the time. But if you're eating carbohydrates, it's probably not really doing that. Right, it's ketosis. If yeah, if you're eating ketosis, that's a different, different story, but most of you guys are eating carbohydrates pretty frequently, right? Yeah. Like every day. So if you're eating carbohydrates every day, you're not in a ketotic state. It's, it's hard to get into yeah, so yeah, yeah, so your body's not utilizing fuel via fat storage. It's utilizing fuel via carbohydrates. So your body will then pump all that carbohydrates into your, into your muscle, which will allow that muscle to be able to contract and expand fully and be able to start to flush out a lot of that dead muscle tissue, and it'll flush out a lot of that lactic acid. And the protein you're consuming will be broken down to amino acids. The amino acids are the building blocks for all your muscles. So you have to be in ketosis to build muscle? No, 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 no. Opposite. Opposite, okay. As long uh, as you're having sufficient protein and carbohydrate intake after a workout, especially yeah. protein intake, you're going to be building muscle. Because mm -hmm. again, your body will break down that protein into its base full amino acids. The more amino acids you're flushing through your body, the more likely you are to build muscle. Interesting. That's your question. So, I mean, if you went home and had like a flank steak or like a like a fly or something like that to work out, totally fine. You'll still be able to put muscle on with that. Because again, you're gonna have enough amino acids flowing through your body to be able to cause protein synthesis to, synthesis to occur. You just wouldn't replenish the glycogen stores in your muscle as fast as someone that's saying 50 grams of glucose after work out. Well, how about with rice? Like if you had the steak and you had, you had like a small- Yeah, steak and rice is fine. Which is probably why though, when, when we did, how long did we do, when we did uh, the RP? So, same reason. so over that time, and I probably did it longer than that, I probably felt like my strength games and stuff might have been better than at any other point with my shitty diet. So I'm glad, I'm glad you brought that up. So, again, yeah, we're talking about muscles contracting and expanding, right? Or contracting and uh, lengthening. So what causes the muscle to contract and lengthen, right? I don't know. What causes the muscle yeah. to contract? For the ATP? Or ATP, right? So. Yeah. Adenosine triphosphate, that's that's the, the like the powerhouse of your cell, your mitochondria makes ATP. So what fuels your cell in order to create ATP? Glucose. Glucose, glucose. right? So the more glucose you have in your muscle, the more production of force can be accrued through that muscle. So Pete said he didn't feel like, or he doesn't feel as strong when he's doing carnivore as he did when he was doing RP, because he's not eating the same amount of calories via carbohydrates. Mm. So his muscle does not have an intramuscular carbohydrate storage as or as high of a level of carbohydrate storage as it would if he's eating carbohydrates frequently. Right? That's why, like, so for instance, me and Ali did a bodybuilding show, as you guys know, a couple weeks ago. Actually, it was like a week ago. So what we did before that was we really, for like the weeks before that, we basically had very really low carb. We're, we're, we know we're not building muscle in the deficit that we're in, right? I mean, that's not the goal. The goal is to maintain the muscle we have. So we're eating a lot enough protein to support that protein synthesis in the muscle to make sure we're not breaking down too much muscle and we're just repairing the muscle that we do have without actually adding new muscle. But we also don't, don't want the intramuscular carbohydrate stores because we're trying to take off body fat. So we can take away those carbohydrate calories really easily. And then before the show, how, much, how many rice cakes did we go to the show? Oh my God, the whole day. 
Uh, it was three dice. Three bag, ten oh, tables. I, yeah, I ate one by myself. And yeah. Like so hours. each one of those price picks is 11 grams of carbs, and we ate them with fat. So we ate them with almond butter on top of them. And that's just to slow down the absorption of those carbohydrates. Because we want to fill the muscle out without burning through those carbohydrates and becoming water. So if you have too much water, too much carbohydrates, your body will hold on to a lot of water and a lot of carbohydrates. But if you have carbohydrates without water, your body will just pump those into the muscle. The muscle looks really full, really round. Everyone on the stage is like, oh my god, it looks so good. <laughs> that's kind of the goal. <laughs> yeah. How long can you keep doing that though? Like what? Like eating like that? Eating like what? Like what you said. You say you, you eat that much. So so, so so we did that for a specific purpose. I would not oh, recommend oh, anyone oh, okay. do that for unless you unless you have like an event, like a show or like a, a wedding or something that you're trying to go to. I would, I'd never put anyone on like any kind of extreme diets. Like I had two clients that I was working with that, that was their wedding, that was a husband and wife, they were married, and they both wanted to look sick for their wedding. So the last couple weeks all right, guys, no carbs, except for we have one day a week where we carb up, just to kind of reset their bodies so they're not angry assholes all the time. And then, <laughs> yeah. and then like, I, I told this one, the, the, the wife, she was like 132 pounds for her shirt, for her wedding the week before, and she was freaking out because she was on her period, and I'm like, don't worry, it's gonna be fine. You're gonna be exactly where you wanna be. So I, I, I manipulated her water and salt a little bit, and guess what she weighed on her wedding day? 124. 122. Wow. And I, I warned her, I was like, I'm like, we can do this, but the odds of you fitting in your dress, it might be a little sketchy. She's like, she like, really like I barely fit in my dress. <laughs> like it was like falling off of her. So I, I warned her, but she chose to do the risk. But wow. I did warn her. Okay. Any other questions about nutrition while we're on the topic? Can you do a separate workshop? We're probably going to that's, 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 that's probably, yeah. that's, that, that's probably going to be the next workshop. It's probably going to be a nutrition based workshop. Yeah, because I have a lot Nutrition of is actually harder than it is than anything. Gym. Yeah. Let's talk about that. Why is nutrition so hard? We, because we, we don't have time oh, to eat, eat or we yeah. buy the food. I think mean, it's because I'm lazy and I'm counting the calories and How carbs and everything. Do. That's why I do carnivore, because I'm like, I don't really gain weight, I eat what I want. We Listen. live in a society where food is plentiful. All right, let's, let's, let's break this down a little bit. Again, I wasn't planning on going into this, we'll talk about heat load in a second, I promise. But let's, let's, I'm going to take one example of why dieting is hard from each one of you, and I'll discuss it. So, Steve. Oh. <laughs> Start with me. Um, poor self-control. Self-control. Okay. So, what about diet is causing you to lack self-control? Well, because uh, I probably don't space them out correctly, and my wife brings way tastier foods around me that I would desire. This, this is a little unfair to, to target him out because his wife is pregnant right now, yeah. uh. and and the uh, the smell of his food makes her sick, and, and so I've Andy been struggling with makes it. Him sick, and she always wants to have different cravings and stuff like that. So this is a little bit different circumstance. Right, when she's like, all right, we have to go to Shake Shack because I want Shake Shack. Well, guess who's definitely caving at that point? Yeah. <laughs> I do love a hamburger. So, Even if I ate all of my meals that day correctly, so, I will so, eat so, that So he's talking about self-control, right? <laughs> so I think what a, the problem with a lot of people, especially in, in our country right now and the way things are, is that again, most of this before, food is so plentiful sure. and it's chemically designed to taste really fucking good and be really, cool oh, yeah. and really yeah. fucking addictive. Um, so what I recommend everyone do, or everyone attempt to do, is try to, try, try to break your addiction to food. And I don't mean that by like, I'm gonna stop eating. I mean, try to think about what causes you to want to eat, right? So I'm stressed, I wanna eat. I had a bad day, I wanna eat. Um, my, my boyfriend broke up with me, I wanna eat. Like, why is that your first instinct is to eat? Oh, so it's hard. It's hard to train. It's accessible, like food with our emotions. Yeah, it feels good. So he's actually nailed on the head. It feels good. So when you eat something that tastes good, what does it do to your body? It wants more. It's a reward hormone, right? That's what I was looking for. It releases endorphins, right? Yeah. So the same thing it does when you have sex or when you, like, anything that feels good, you take it on a roller coaster, anything like that, anything that feels like awesome, your body releases endorphins right away. Right. Okay? And what does that do? It tells you, I want more of whatever that is, yeah. okay? But you don't have to listen to those endorphins, right? Yeah. Like, you don't have to, like, like serial killers listen to them because they, they murder people. It feels really good for them. Mm. And, and they keep doing it. And they keep doing it, right? Like, I just watched that Dahmer show on Netflix. It was great. Oh, my God. That was <laughs> fake. It was great. Yeah, okay. But, like, <laughs> but even at the end, he was like, it almost made me feel bad for Yeah, totally. Totally, totally. That's totally, why totally. I want to watch it. But, like, you can see it in him. Like, imagine if he's so addicted to killing people, he's eating food. 
he's the same thing, right? He's like, he's like, I know there's something wrong with me, right. and I want to stop, but like, break. I can't. Right. So, one of the things I tell my clients is you got to try to break your addiction to food. So it's like everyone might be subtly addicted to food. I was too. I was a fucking fat kid until I was like 18, and I weighed like 300 fucking pounds. It's terrible. And I didn't know. I didn't like. I was like, I was looking at people go to the gym. I'm like, oh, you guys are idiots, wasting your fucking life in the gym. <laughs> now I go to the gym. Anyway, but like. I, I broke my addiction to food. Like I, I didn't even know I was into food. I was like, oh, I just reached for this while I was hungry, and I was like, oh, there's a Twinkie here, and I'm like, sure. Like, I order a pizza, whatever, eat a whole fucking pizza. And I can still do that if I want, but I don't want to anymore. Because there's, there's gotta be something in your lives that's more important to you than food, right? Whether it's health, whether it's your relationship with your significant other, whether it's your mental clarity, whether it's your job, there's gotta be something that's more important to you than the food. And every time you're hungry, just think about that. Like, is, are my goals in life fueled by what am I eating today, right? Or am I working towards something that, and, I, and I eat this whole chocolate cake and it help me work towards that? I right? will say though, before we cut, like that first couple, when we had that first mm -hmm. uh, meal set, I never touched anything else. It was when it started, we started cutting that being all those things in front of me pushed me, it was harder. Yeah, well I mean, when, once you start to reach a point where you're like actually cutting food and you're like, you are physiologically hungry, that's a different story. But it was only then, like after, because when we started cutting down and everything, yeah. and then, then she's like, like I can't do this anymore. And she's like, like, oh, I'm just gonna have pasta and spaghetti and cheese in front of me. And I was like, I hate you. Yeah. Like, like again, like me, me, me and Alex came up this like six month cut getting ready for these shows. And like the last like eight weeks, I'd say, like probably the hungriest I've ever been in my entire life. Did I go out and eat cookies and crackers and fucking cake and shit? No, because I knew that I had a goal that I wanted to achieve and that, that was to have a certain look on the stage. Does that mean that I sat home watching the Food Channel all day? I have done that much twice. <laughs> I would have watched food eating challenges on YouTube right, right. every day for, for six weeks. <laughs> and like, I didn't eat that stuff, but like, I was just like imagining what it would be like if I could eat that stuff. And it, 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 it was something I did, I, I didn't like, necessarily want to do it, but like, it like drew me in. Like, it was like, but I was like eating through someone else. Right. Also, That's what you, do. you can it's eat like, a lot of certain things, but it depends on the choices of what you eat too. That's absolutely true too. Um, so we talked about Steve's question. You got, a, you got a diet question. What makes diet hard for you? Um, well, I have I have pretty good self control, but I guess I'm lazy. So when it comes to having to meal prep, eat seventy five grams of fucking oatmeal in the morning, <laughs> stuff, like, like measuring all that and everything, that's just like uh. okay. So he's talking about being lazy, right? And his words, not mine. So what can we do to make our time in meal prepping more efficient? Do it ahead of time. Doing it ahead of time. Make sure ahead of time. Yeah, do it ahead of time, right? So, if you have, say, you're off on Sunday, which most of you are, like, all right, I'm gonna spend, I'm gonna take two hours out of my whole day on Sunday to prep at least Monday through Thursday. Okay, maybe I go crazy on Friday, Saturday, and I re-prep again on Sunday. But if you spend that time on Sunday, it's gonna pay off for the rest of the week, right? I mean. Would you rather spend two hours on Sunday or stress out the whole week about what am I gonna eat all day and then make a bunch of bad choices, right? right? Is, it, is it more valuable to you to have that, that two hours on Sunday than it would be for you to like stress that out like eating what you're gonna eat every single day of the week? Mm -hmm. And then like, oh, I don't have time to make food right now, I'm just gonna go to 7-Eleven and get a fucking hot dog. <laughs> Dude, you'd, be, you'd, be, you'd be amazed oh, at how many people are buying 7-Eleven hot dogs and I grab a fucking hot dog. I don't think I've yeah. ever had a seven. You see, I love, I enjoy having, looking forward to, oh, I have to prep things. Like, I enjoy that in like, okay. wanting to do it. Mm -hmm. So, I don't meal prep. My problem is that whoa, I go. You enjoy meal prepping? So you don't no, 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 no. Like, <laughs> when you put me on the diet, yeah. I was looking forward to measuring my cup every day, yeah. putting it in, you know. Mm -hmm. I, and I wasn't doing it on Sunday for the whole week. I was doing it as I was eating. Yeah, of course. So, I like that. My problem is that I go longer periods of not eating because I'm not hungry, because I'm worked out, and I consciously don't want to eat because I just put, spend a whole hour kicking my ass, right? Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not hungry, so when I feel like, okay, you have to eat because you don't want to get to the point that you're going to be overly hungry, right? Mm -hmm. So I eat, and then I feel bad when I ate, even though I know consciously is good, the rice is good, the jerky, mm -hmm. the is good, whatever, but then I'm like, no, I'm not. So what makes you feel bad about eating? I just don't know why I'm not losing weight. Uh, what makes you about not eating? Yeah. Makes me feel bad? Yeah. So, so you said you ate that meal and you felt bad about mm -hmm. eating that meal. Yeah. What, so what I, made, like, I didn't eat all day. I worked out and now I'm eating this meal. I'm like, 
put it's a good meal. Yeah, so I, yeah. I, exactly. I think it's more my mind. Like, I need to retrain yeah. my mind. Like, you eat eating five days a week. Well, remember how many times I had you eating a day? And yes. you were still losing weight? Yes. So it's like, I think a lot of people get the misconception that, like, oh, if I'm eating every two or three hours, like, I'm going to gain weight. And that's not true. It's just, it's an energy balance issue. It's, 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 you have to stop thinking about it emotionally. The dieting is, is a, for most people, the biggest doubt about the diet is their emotions, right? Because mm-hmm. they attach emotions to food. Whether it's, a, if I eat this, I'm gonna get fat. Or if I, if I don't eat, I'm gonna stay skinny. Like, or if I eat this cake, it's bad for me. If I eat this, if I eat this rice, it's good for me. So a lot of this stuff is, is all misconceptions. Like, there is no good or bad food. Like, there's just calories, mm-hmm. right? So if a chocolate cake might have 4,000 calories in it, and a fucking giant bowl of rice might have 2,000 calories in it, okay? That's all it is, it's calories. Carbohydrates, fat, carbohydrates, fat, protein, boom, 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 boom. Having, the, have, uh, looking at a food as a bad food or a good food is automatically putting you in a bad position. We say that shit a lot, where it's like, I'm having a cheat day, like, I'm having to have all the bad food that I want. It's like, no you're not, you're just having, it's basically a higher calorie. Like, like yeah, like, I might call a meal a cheat meal, but like, it knows not cheating, it's just like, I'm just eating something that's not on my regular diet plan, okay? And, it's, and, and if, if I want to have it, I'll fucking have it. But that might mean that I need to like take away calories from some other section of that day. Mm-hmm. So if I know I'm gonna go out for fucking steaks and burgers or whatever at night, I might be like, all right, like if I'm gonna go fucking balls of wall tonight, I'm gonna have 2,000 calories extra. Then I might try to move, take away 1,000 calories from some of my meals before that in order to make sure I'm not like overdoing it to the extent where I'm gonna fucking blow my weekly caloric load over the top. Does that make sense? I just feel like I go hungry, like I know I'm hungry, but I'm like, oh, I don't wanna eat anything. I gotta, I gotta I'm like, just trying to balance. <laughs> aspect is putting on muscle yeah. because of the scale of the what? Scale of the yeah. So that, that for, for men too, like especially for guy bodybuilders, it's kind of hard. But for women especially, like seeing that number go up in the scale is like so mentally fucking taxing that like you need to be able to put that behind you. Because when you're adding muscle, you're not adting muscle in a vacuum. Okay? I use this example all the time when I talk about adding muscle to you. Have you ever seen a steak that has zero fat in it? It doesn't exist. So when you put muscle tissue on, your body's automatically gonna put fat on. And the ratio is, in, is not the ratio is not favorable for muscle tissue. Okay, it could be like if you're like genetically elite, you might be like, if you put on three pounds, probably two of that pound is gonna be fat, one of it's gonna be muscle. I'll say that a lot of them like that's like elite genetics. Is it impossible to not gain weight and put on muscle? Is it impossible to just not gain weight and put on muscle? No. Uh, no, but you can re- well, the answer is not no. The answer is, is yes, it's possible, but in very specific circumstances. So, for instance, if I had a new person that's never worked out their entire life come in here, the first 10 to 12 weeks they're in here, their body's gonna be changing so rapidly where they're gonna be dropping body fat and putting muscle on at the same time. But like I said before, your body adapts very fucking quickly. So once you're adapted to weight training, training in general, that doesn't happen anymore. At that point, you need to be in a surplus to put on muscle and you'll put on fat too. We need to be in a deficit to take away fat and hopefully keep as much muscle as possible. Wow. But yeah, that, we call that newbie gains or like beginner gains. Like that's like, that first like three or four months up to probably six months of working out, if you've never worked out before, you will put on muscle and burn fat faster than any other point in your entire life. Even if you were to take anabolic steroids or anything like that, nothing is better than those first six months of working out. And you can never repeat that process because then your body remembers. So if you worked out when you were like a kid and you like worked like savage for like five, six years, then you stopped two years off, you wouldn't necessarily have beginner gains when you got back. You would just get back to your baseline very quickly that you had before. So can you speed up the muscle growth by taking supplements? Uh, so <laughs> if they pick, so yeah, if you were to take like steroids, you'd have to speed up the muscle growth. I mean juice. You'd also Same. like muscle growth. Can you also, you can you tell growth. me anything? You also, you'd also <laughs> viralize yourself very quickly if you grow a lot of facial hair. And, you're such a solid man. Really? You have clitoral growth, so you have a giant clit. Right. No, 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 no. That's some trend or something. Yeah. No, but you introduce on our diet, you make us eat protein and all that. Yeah. That's what you do. So, yeah, protein shakes are supplements that just allow you to get protein in without having to ingest solid foods. 
But that helps muscle, right? Yeah, no, but it's, 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 it's the same thing as eating a piece of chicken. It's just a different alternative. Oh, wheat. What is that? Not how. Yeah, waste 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 is the byproduct of making milk and cheese. So it's oh. like it's like the waste product of making milk and cheese, and they'll use that to then supplement protein. So if you don't want to eat a chicken breast, if you don't have time to make a chicken breast, and you can have a protein shake. That's a good alternative. It's not, it's not something that should be used all the time because oh. whole foods have a lot more minerals and a lot more uh, vitamins than protein shakes do. So they're always going to be a better option if you don't. But if you don't have the option, so say you're running around all day, like, fuck, I can't like make a fucking chicken breast right now. It's not a protein shake. It's the same amount of. So if you're four ounces of chicken breast or you're one protein shake, it's generally the same amount of protein. Gotcha. Make sense? Mm -hmm. all right. So those supplements are good, but not that. <laughs> this, this is gonna be a long conversation with those supplements, but there, there are like there, there are supplements that are proven to help you put on muscle. So like creatine is like one of the most researched supplements. Like fish oil. I never understood how you how people consume that. Like. It's a powder or a pill. Yeah, yeah. But you just put it in your meal. And well, so if you're eating if you're, if you're eating enough red meat, you don't really need something with creatine because creatine comes from red meat essentially. Uh -huh. um, but if you're not eating your red meat, I generally supplement. Like, I take like ten grams of creatine in the morning via pills. Or something. Fucking horse pills, and I'll just take them, drink them down, and then I know I have enough creatine to go work out that day. Mm. I don't have any red meat in my diet right now. Um, I think my, like, the thing that I have a blind spot to is I don't have any idea how many calories I'm actually consuming in a day or a week. Okay. For that so, matter, so, this is a super easy question. So, the best way to do it is to, there's apps you can download on your phone, especially in modern age, so it's a super easy way to track. So, My Fitness Pal is a totally free app that you can download on your phone. They have like all like fucking the restaurants you go to, like McDonald's, Burger King, all those places, like all built in there. Like, their menus are all built in. So you get, okay, I had a Big Mac, boom. Okay, that's 600 calories. That's a large fry, that's another 500 calories. Right, that meal is 1,100 calories. Boom, boom, boom. And then, like I said, after a week, you can just divide that number by seven. And assuming that you stay the same weight from point A to point B, that means that you will get your maintenance level count. So and then this is where we cut, this is just reduce that number by 500, or if you want to gain weight, increase it by 500. Oh, so if you want to lose that amount, what you weigh for that is it, just reduce it by 500, yes. no matter what. So once you have, once you establish your maintenance point, so say that's 2,000 calories, if you were to go down to 1,500 calories, over a seven day period, it means you minus 3,500 calories from your diet, and 3,500 calories is equivalent to one pound. Diet. So I my my struggle is I don't eat enough and okay. I feel like with my schedule and I, I just can't consume I make healthy choices, I don't eat fast food, I don't like I don't crave any of that because mm -hmm. I'm so conditioned for so long just to like and I have stomach issues so I can't even eat bad. Okay. But I just don't have time like to to eat and I'm hungry obviously because mm -hmm. I'm training here and but um I just I don't have time. So you go hungry? Like you feel hungry? I'm starving like all day. I'm hungry all the time. You're not afraid to eat, yeah. I'm not afraid to eat. I mean I'm afraid to eat because you're everything you told me to eat, I'm definitely you're afraid. Like, too much. I'm like, afraid to eat, eat, but I don't have time to consume all that. I'm teaching. I'm not. I can't eat in front of my students. I have a life skills class. Like I'm not gonna be like, hold on, guys, and scarf something down. I don't. I just don't know when to eat all my food. Okay. And I'm good. I can meal prep all that. I just don't. I'm like, when am I eating all this? Wow. So, that's an, amazing, so that's an amazing problem. <laughs> so, so when we're talking about optimizing meal timings, so you're gonna have to basically prioritize the times of day when you. So, say you have a 2,000 calorie a day diet. Mm -hmm. You, so, I can just do some math in my head. So, say like you have like 300 grams of carbs, that's 1,200 calories. Say another 150 grams of protein, that's uh, 400 calories. So, that's 400, 400, 600. So, then the rest goes from fat. You want to prioritize those calories around your workout. So, you work out at 5 in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. How do you wake up? I wake up at 445. Okay, 445 daily. So, when you wake up, do you name it? Coffee and anything like that? No. Okay. So I would recommend you wake up and you have some sort of shake when you wake up. So maybe. So I also take medicine in the morning that I can't eat for an hour. I have to be on an empty okay. stomach. So, so that's my. So that, yeah, that doesn't. So you can't yeah. eat. So if you take whatever 445, you can't until 545. Yes. All right. So I would bring that shake with you when you do that then. So okay. and then at 545, if you're able to eat, then I would drink probably half that shake because you want to have the whole thing. And I probably have like a good amount of protein. 
so the cars measured, and you're at 50 grams of protein, 50 grams of carbs. When you consume half of that during the workout, it means you're getting 25 grams of protein, 25 grams of carbs to start to fill your muscle back in after the workout. Now to finish the shake after your workout. So now you just have basically 200 grams, or sorry, 100 grams, 400 calories in that shake, and it's 6.30 in the morning, so you're at 400 calories of your 2,000 calories. Mm -hmm. And then, what time do you go to work? Um, usually eating like breakfast in my car at 7.15. Okay, so. Eat there by 8. <laughs> and do you any time between 6.30 and 7.15 eat? No. Okay. I'm so, getting myself ready and for the kids. What, what, what was your breakfast food? Uh, I have three eggs and two pieces of toast. Okay, so that's minimal protein, a lot of fat, or not a lot of fat, decent amount of fat. Two egg, fish. eggs, like one egg white and two yolks. So again, if, if you don't have time, throw some turkey. If you don't have time to eat, and again, this is very, this is, this is like for people that are like you that are scheduled are insane. They they make meal replacement shakes, like shakes that you that have high amounts. You of know, protein. for me, when I like, I don't know if it's mental. I have to chew. My, like I like to chew. If I'm drinking my meals, I'm hungry. Like I like, I need to. So one of the great things about protein food. powders is you can put a little bit of water and mix it up, and it makes a really good pudding. And <laughs> so I do that all the time. Like sometimes, like I've seen, her, I've, seen her, I've seen her do rice cakes, and she makes a protein pudding and puts it on top of her rice cakes. Oh. They actually even have protein pudding. Yeah, they have protein pudding too. Um, also, another good thing you can do, so to say, like, can you eat rice? Is that body sweat? Uh, no, I take calories. So another option is like cream of rice. So cream of rice is like baby rice. That's what they're called. You said cream. Yeah, cream of rice, and there's companies like Pride Foods that make it like flavored, that are like delicious, like brownie flavored and shit like that. And like a little fucking scoop. Can you eat cream of rice instead of the boiled rice? Yeah. Why did you tell me that before? <laughs> yeah. Funny enough, for instance, the cream of rice, if you heat it up in the microwave and you like, like mix it, it gets really voluminous, right? Okay. And you can even throw a scoop of protein powder in there, or like berries or like whatever you want mm -hmm. in there. And the good thing about it is it's really good cold. So like, if you're in the car, you could get like, instead of getting like the three egg whites and like two pieces of toast, yeah. which is like maybe like 300 calories at most, like probably not even that much, but 200. I eat that <laughs> like, yeah, you're so you have a giant bowl of cream of rice with protein powder and maybe get 100 grams of carbs because, again, you're post workout, which is the time you need carbs the most, mm -hmm. and you need a good amount of protein in the workout. So, you basically get 30 grams of protein, 100 grams of carbs. That's 130, that's 130 grams total times four, which is what, like 400 or 500, it's over 500 calories right there. Mm -hmm. So, if you can front load a lot of your carbs and calories and the rest of the day just kind of run around by until dinner's coming around and it's more protein and fat at dinner. It's gonna be a really good option. So again, it's, it's gonna be. Can you not eat all day and then pack your whole meal in one day? Or that's not suggesting anymore. Yeah. yeah. It's not. So you can't. You can do that. Uh, I mean, you can do anything you want, really. But that's not. That, that's it's not. That's not gonna be the most efficient way to basically eat calories. Because again, your metabolism is gonna be really slow in the first part of the day because your body's not getting any calories. Your body's like, all right, I guess we're not like. Need to yeah, I think it basically is all about choices and how you manage. And I, I, I've never done that approach before. I used to like one meal a day. Yeah. But like, I can imagine that like trying to eat like twenty five hundred calories in a meal. I could. I could. No, but like, of like <laughs> good <laughs> calories. I swear to you. No, I'm saying, I'm saying like, imagine, imagine you're trying to eat three thousand calorie a day diet. Yeah. And now you try to put all three thousand calories into one meal. I mean, you will make bad choices. Bad choices. No, no, but like a good meal. Like, try, oh. Imagine trying to eat like. Say I eat 300 grams of rice. So it'd be like all the rice and <laughs> like, like you, you have like a bowl like this fucking big bowl of rice and chicken. It would like, take me like an hour plus. If, if you could even fish. Yeah. Like, yeah. like, yeah. like, yeah. like yeah. I eat 350 grams of protein a day, and yeah. some days I eat 500 or 400 grams of carbs. Yeah. Imagine yeah. trying to eat all that. Like, yeah. The bowl of rice I pull out every morning that I, I cook overnight is fucking gigantic. Like it would take me probably an hour to eat just the rice, and I probably like four pounds of chicken and turkey I gotta eat too. So it's like. Yeah, that's a man versus food. So it would, it would be like the point where your stomach hurts so bad that like, you need more to eat more. Alright, we're going to move on to our okay. final two topics. Before we uh, do that, does anyone have any questions about nutrition before we move on? No. Okay. Again, we're going to have another nutrition seminar at some point. Yeah. Probably around, no, I hope maybe before Thanksgiving. Before the holidays. Yes, yes. Just to remind everybody. So, we talked about periodization, we talked about uh, all that stuff. Now we're going to talk about deloading when progress begins to get. So basically, say we're on a 16 week program, we get to four weeks in, we're like, all right, like, I'm really fucking sore in my triceps, or I'm really sore in my quads, and like my strength numbers are now. So let's say I did leg extension, I did 100 pounds, the week before I did 100 pounds for 15, 
14 and 13 for my three sets. This week, I did 100 pounds for 12, 11, 10. Same weight, but I got less reps. What does that mean? You passed that MRV thing? I passed my MRV, right? I passed my maximum curl required. And so therefore, I'm not recovering optimally to be able to continue progressing my lifts. So if your reps are going down, your weight's going down, you're not sleeping as well, mm -hmm. you're like feeling off in general, now it's time to deload, okay? Mm -hmm. And deloading could mean a couple of things. So how do we deload? There's multiple ways to deload. We can decrease the volume that we're doing. So say for instance, if we're doing three sets of 10 reps at a 300 pound squat, okay? What we can do then is the next week, we can decrease the volume of weight that we're doing. So we can cut that weight in half. So you do three sets of 10 at 150 pounds. So we're still getting some work in, but now the weight's much lighter. It allows us to recover a lot more and we're not experiencing as much fatigue as we were before, okay? And then after a week of doing that, we come back next week, super fresh, ready to go. Ready to go. Now we're ready to start, and not the top end where we're starting before, so if we're doing three sets of 10 at 300 before, we might want to start a little bit back with like 285, three sets of 10, and then work your way past that 300 mark eventually over the next four weeks, okay? Another way we can do it is we can cut the reps down. So say you're on a strength focused cycle, you really are feeling good, you want to be feeling strong, but now things are starting to break down a little bit. So we did three by 10 at, at 300 pounds. This week, instead of dropping the weight in half and doing three by 10 at 150, we're gonna do three by five at 300 pounds. So we just cut the volume of that set in half as opposed to cutting the volume of weight in half, okay? That's gonna allow you to continue to experience that heavy weight, which is if your know, goal is to like get really strong and really big, you gotta lift heavy weights, and you, wanna, you don't really wanna forget what those weights feel like. If you take a whole week off squatting mm. heavy and you put a heavy bar on your back again, you're like, oh, fuck, this is heavy. Yeah. Yeah. So if you did the same weight, but for half the amount of work, you're still lowering your volume and allowing your body to recover, but you're still having some of that experience of that load in the heavy weight. So those are two ways you can do it. If you're feeling really fucking tired and really beat up, you can do both. You can cut the weight in half and cut the reps in half. So 150 pound squat, three sets of five, your body's gonna feel so much fucking better, and you're not gonna have as much of that like strength factor still playing you effects. So the next week you're not gonna be like, oh, this 300 pound squat feels super fucking light now, but it's gonna, but it's gonna, your body's gonna feel a lot fresher in general. Um, and if you get to the point where you the end of like say like three cycles of trying to do this, so let's say I do a four week block, I'm trying to build my triceps. At the end of that four weeks, I'm like fuck, I'm so tired. My triceps are killing me. Like I cannot recovering. One week deload, another maybe switch exercises. Do another four week block, okay, I'm dying again, another deload, another four week block. After that block, I would take a week or two of active rest where you're just like resting, doing like activities, like fun stuff like outside, but not like in here stressing your body out like crazy. Like a one week's kind of a minimum, two weeks is kind of like, especially if you're like a 16 or 20 week program, you generally want to take a week to two weeks off. I'll just do like active stuff outside the gym, but not lifting weights, and then come back fresh, ready to go again. I program those deloads kind of into our CrossFit workouts. The problem is like not everyone comes every single day of the week. So like, if like one person only comes like two days a week, they might not need to deal for six months. Mm -hmm. But if someone's coming five or six days a week, you need to start monitoring your own bodies. I mean like, yeah. I need to fucking take this chill this week. So like, just cause weights are prescribed doesn't mean you have to do those weights, right? Can I just add something sure. to your point about um, yes, like you the, the deloading <laughs> for like a week or so? Yeah. When I'm really big on like studying my calendar, so like when I see that um, in November that I'm going to be visiting my parents for Thanksgiving, I'll tell myself, okay, like I really want to push myself really hard for like a couple weeks before that because then when I go to visit my parents, it kind of like builds a natural like yeah, so she's deload naturally deloading into my calendar, not being in the gym, and then I come back and I'm really fresh. Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, I mean, that's a great way to do it. So if you guys know you're gonna be away from the gym for a certain amount of time, you can increase the intensity or increase the volume for that weeks leading up to that. And then, because you know that I'm going to Punta Canta for a week, I'm not gonna be lifting a lot of weights or doing a lot of like, stuff that's gonna be really taxing, but I'm probably gonna be doing a lot of activity stuff. <laughs> Might want to raft or I'm gonna go cave exploring or whatever I do down there. And then when you get back, you feel very fresh when you go again. Some of the heavier weights might feel a little bit heavier. And that's gonna, you're gonna adapt to that very quickly. But when you come back, you come back and then sets you left or you, you start low again? You would start slightly lower than you start before. Yeah. So yeah, you start slightly lower than you did before because again, you just took a week off, so you don't want to jump right back into 100%. Because that, that, if you jump right back into that same spot you left off on, you're going to deload a lot sooner than if you start a little bit further back and then progress past that point. So for instance, if you were squatting 300 pounds for 3 to 10 at the end of your program, 
and you start with uh, 280, first week 290, second week 300, and then the fourth week you go to 310, and that 310 is more than you hit before, and you might need to deload after that. So if you started at 300, went to 305, went to 310, third week, you might need to deload two weeks instead of what you deload four weeks. And the more time you can spend not deloading, the more time you have to put on more hypertrophy. If you're not putting on muscle during the hypertrophy or during, during that deload week. What you're doing is allowing your central nervous system to relax, allowing your body to fully recover so you can add hypertrophy in more later. But again, your body's gonna get so beat up at some point that it's not gonna prioritize putting on muscle. It's gonna prioritize recovering as opposed to like, or as opposed to adding new muscle and new weight. It's gonna prioritize letting your central nervous system come down and relax. Because again, a lot of these movements are very taxing, especially the work that we do in the crossfit, like deadlifts and squats mm -hmm. and stuff. They tax a lot of your body. And then eventually you're gonna need a fucking break. Mm -hmm. Which is why we don't, we don't do one or maxes and then immediately go to like another one or max front squat or back squat. Because if you're too taxed from that one or max back squat, and do a one or max front squat. Instead of you a more volume approach. The reason I do that is because if your max back squat is 405, for instance, we do one or max, and then next week I program three sets of 20, I think you're gonna be doing like 300 pounds for sets of 20. It might be like half that one, right? For sets of 20. Because now we just did what? He loaded. So we took half the weight. Did a little more work, but hey, we are able to recover from that. Make sense? All right, so how does this fit into our class programming? So class programming framework, what do we do on Mondays? Squats. Squats, right? Legs. Legs, Legs are on Monday. What's on Tuesday? Uh, well, now it's cleans. Cleans, right? So a little more legs, but then what's the workout generally? Now it's like upper body stuff, right? Push-ups, dips, oh. and say push-ups, push presses, strip presses. So the first day is a leg day, second day is upper body day, generally some sort of pushing movement. Wednesday is what? Strength, strength, yeah. balance. Strength, balance, and that alternates between upper and lower body every other week, or every three weeks. And then also the workout's more cardio focused, I don't know if you guys notice that, but I don't really put a lot of barbells or dumbbells into those workouts, they're more of like, if we're gonna do the bike, we're gonna do some dumbbell unders, we're gonna do a skier, we're gonna do something else, we're gonna do a row or something else. Because again, we just hit upper body and lower body, so we need a little chance to recover. So the best way to do that is just to do some active recovery. So we're just doing more of a conditioning workout that day. Thursday, we go back to snatches. Generally, some sort of lower body stuff, like thrusters, wall walls, stuff like that. Then we're doing snatches our legs, just to hit our shoulders, and our legs a little bit, and then we're gonna, we sh should be theoretically recovered from our upper bar, from our Monday squat session by that Thursday. Mm -hmm. And then Friday is deadlifts mm -hmm. and so like more posterior chain stuff and then bench press. So remember the upper body day and then Saturday is just kind of a longer conditioning piece, workout, work some strong muscle. So I would also say, what is the best day to stay behind and use this thing? So that's gonna depend on what you're trying to bring up, right? So your lagging body part. Like I said, you can really, really specialize in one muscle group at a time. So if for instance, your quads are your lagging muscle group, what would be the best day to hit your quads? Wednesday or Thursday? Well, it wouldn't be one Monday, would it? After the why, would, why wouldn't it be Monday? Because you already did your legs. So if we did one set of squats that were really heavy on Monday. Well, that's true. And then we did maybe like a workout that's got like, at the most four rounds of some lighter squats and something that, that probably didn't stimulate the muscle to the hardest extent it could. Mm -hmm. Monday would actually be a good day to do squats right after. We just trained our legs to a certain point, but we might have a few sets left, especially if we're isolating. When we're using our whole leg for a workout, so we got like um, Russian kettlebell swings and echo bike and something like that in a workout. Like our quads are really being hit in the bike minimally by the resistance of the bike, and they got hit during that squat. So maybe we did like count as like three sets of work on squats around quads. Now we go over the leg extension, we go over the leg press, and now we can get two or three more sets of volume in there in that day. And then my legs are gonna be sore anyway, so I might as well hit them a little bit harder in that day. And then we're not doing anything but conditioning on Wednesday, right? Yeah. So if I'm recovered by Wednesday, I could probably fit one or two sets in of quads on Wednesday, but I know I'm also gonna be doing another leg workout on Thursday. So I don't wanna do too much work, so that'd be a good day to do one or two sets just to keep the stimulus going, and then hit it again hard on Thursday. And then if we're getting to Saturday, we're not doing a heavy leg workout on Saturday, so that'd be another good day to put quads in. So you have to play with this. You have to figure out what days you need to put the work in. And why are you targeting? And what are you targeting? Pat, can you set up like something where you show, I mean, me personally, I don't know how to use some of these machines. Yeah, of course, we can use something like that. We don't have time right now. No, not now, but like. Yeah, I'm sorry. Another, another time. 
Yeah, for sure. Um, we can definitely talk about how to use the machine and stuff like that. And like a whole other seminar by itself. But generally speaking, generally speaking, you want to target the muscle group on the day you do it in class, and then any other day of the week that you're recovered enough to hit. So if we're doing upper body stuff on Tuesday and Friday, those would be two good days to add in some extra upper body accessory work after that workout, and then maybe one other day of the week. So a great day to hit that would be like Monday. So you're not exhausting your muscles. Because you're, you just train legs on Monday, and then if I need to hit triceps after legs, there's gonna be no carryover stimulus from the legs to the triceps, right? So my triceps should be totally fresh even if I just blew up an entire leg workout, <laughs> right? So if I wait 15 minutes, I should still hit my triceps pretty fucking hard. But keep in mind, we're using them on Tuesday. So, you gotta, those are things you gotta think about. You don't wanna destroy them, you wanna stimulate them. And then you really don't think you should do more than one isolation at a time? No, two is fine. Two would be all right. Yeah, two movements. Uh, generally, two movements, because if you're such a, like a muscle like a tricep, you gotta hit multiple angles. So, like an overhead movement and a push down movement. No, 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 no. I mean, if you wanted to work on two different muscle groups. Uh, if, um, again, if, you, if, if you were doing a strictly like bodybuilding type, like I'm trying to improve muscle group, you could probably get away with two. Maybe even three if you were like really, really recovering really well. But in the cross, we're saying because you're using so many different muscle groups every single day during cross workouts, the odds of you being able to hit multiple muscle groups in a row while still being able to recover from wads yeah. is very fucking slim. So I would start with one and then try to come up with a program like, okay, I'm gonna start with two days a week for the first four weeks. And if I'm recovering from those two days, I take my active rest at the end of that, or I take my deload after those four weeks, and then I can maybe try up to three days. Okay. If I can still recover from that after four weeks, take a deload, go to four days for the last block. And then you're taking your two weeks off, you're taking your one week active rest off, so you know you're going to recover from that. Does that make sense? I mean, this is just food for thought, guys. You guys don't have to do this if you don't want to. No, I want to. I'm, 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 I'm getting old. I'm going to do it. I want to. So you're getting old? Hold on. Before, before everyone walks away, I just want to make one final point. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. no. So again, this was a long seminar, so we'll spend two hours talking about this stuff. But the, 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 the key points I want you guys to remember from this.